verses 16 to 20, the word of God says this. But the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, these are the last words of the Lord Jesus after his death, his burial, his resurrection, and before his ascension into heaven. And he's speaking to his disciples there. He's told them because he died, obviously, in Jerusalem. And now he's asked them before he had died to go to Galilee into the north to a mountain that he had designated. Now, I think it's interesting when you look at verse 17 and you think of that. Here's men who've been with him for three years. They've seen miracles. They've seen Lazarus come forth from the grave who'd been dead for four days. They had seen Jesus make people walk the blind to see. And now they see Jesus. Some worshipped him, but some did what? Doubted. Now, as we begin, I, I'm, I'm one that asks questions, so you're going to be able to talk today, all right? I, I know you don't talk in church, but today you're going to, you're going to be able to, all right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> whom is he speaking to in these verses? His disciples. All right, good. Now, let me just ask another question. How many disciples of the Lord Jesus do we have here today? If you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus, raise your hand. All right. So in application, whom is Jesus speaking to in these verses? Us. Well, now let's make it a little bit more personal. He's speaking to who? To me. And if you want to even make it more personal, he's speaking to Walter, and he's speaking to whatever your name is. So you need to listen because he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. Now, in verse 18, he says, all authority has been given to me. What does the word all mean? Nothing left out, right? No exception. What does authority mean? What's authority? Power. Control. So all power, all control has been given to me. Who gave it to me? God the Father gave it to Jesus. So therefore, he says, because I have all authority and all power has been given to me, both in heaven and on earth. Now, here's another question. Can you think of any other place besides heaven and earth? No. So any and everywhere we know of, Jesus has power and authority. Correct? All right. Now, as we go on, then you look at verse 19, and in verse 19, what is the command in verse 19? Go. As you're going. As you're going. Thank you. Our PhD guru, John, is absolutely correct. Because the aorist tense verbs should be saying, as you are going, the command would be, make disciples. Now, now the reason why, where were those disciples at that time? They were in Jerusalem. What did it say? They had proceeded from Jerusalem. They were in Galilee on a mountain where Jesus had told them to go before his death. So they're there, and Jesus is there with them, talking to them. So does Jesus think, and do they think they're going to stay forever on that mountain? No. So as they leave that mountain, as they're going, the command would be to make disciples. So as you're going, make disciples. Now, we're not going to stay here forever in this building, are we? No. Now, I might keep you to three or four in the afternoon, but that's all right. But we're eventually going to what? Leave. So the command of Jesus for us is to do what? To go as we're going, make disciples. The command is to make disciples. Now, if we're to make disciples, we need to know what a disciple is. Now, some of you young folks could Google 
and look at the word disciple, and you'll find that the disciple is this. A definition of a disciple is someone who accepts the message of someone else, number one, and who spreads and shares that same message with others. That's a disciple. One who accepts the message of someone else and who spreads that same message to others. Now, you are our disciples of Jesus here. You received a message from somebody, didn't you? A faithful Sunday school teacher. A mom or dad. Someone in BBS. Or maybe it was a pastor. An evangelist. Maybe it was a friend. Someone shared with you about Jesus. Is that correct? Yes. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you said, yes, I recognize that I am undone. I'm a sinner, and I need to turn from my sin, and I need to come and place my faith and trust in Christ. So therefore, I have accepted Christ, so therefore my need now is to do what? Share that same message with others. You know, we sing a hymn in church. I love to tell the story of Jesus and his love. So question we might want to ask ourselves is simply this. When's the last time you told the story? Because to be a disciple means I accept the message of Jesus and then I share it with others. And isn't that what a missionary does? Exactly. You know, as we think about being missionaries, we have missionaries today in Saudi Arabia. Now, do you know much about Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia is a country with 99.9999999% Muslim. Mm. They don't allow missionaries in there. <laughs> but there's missionaries there. How are they there? They may be there as nurses, engineers, or whatever. But their real purpose is not to be a nurse or to be an engineer, but to be a missionary. But the only way they can get in the country and stay in the country is to do nursing and engineering and other things that they're doing. But they're there, there today. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. But now here's a question I have to ask. What's the difference between what they're doing today in Saudi Arabia and what we at May River Baptist Church can do here in Bluffton area? Is there any difference? We got freedom. We got freedom. They don't. There's nothing else. We just need to see ourselves as intentional missionaries because the one with all authority and all power has commanded us and commissioned us to do what? As we leave here, be making disciples. To be sharing with folks and talking with people about Jesus. But then he says, not only are we to make disciples, but then we're to do what? We are to get them baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then he also tells his disciples in verse 20, what else are they to do after they have shared with someone, after the person has said yes to Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, I'm separated from you, and they are baptized, then what else are we supposed to be doing? <laughs> teaching them. Teaching them what? All things. And the word all is what? None left out. But not only teaching them, but mine has teaching them to observe. What does the word observe mean? See, look, and they do. So can we put it this way? Teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. You know, because it's interesting. Jesus says, if you remember, if you read the Bible, right, Jesus says, and see if you can finish this. If you love me, you'll go to church every Sunday. If you love me, you'll spend time reading your Bible every day. If you love me, you'll spend time praying all the time. Did he say that? Those are all good things. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? Keep, obey my commandments. And Jesus tells the disciples here what? Teaching them, training them to obey all the commands that I've commanded you. Now, if I'm to do that, guess what I might better be doing? As much as possible, I might better be what? Obeying and observing and doing. Because if I tell someone to do something, but I'm not doing it, what's the word that they call it? A hypocrite. So we need to make sure that we are doing that, you know. And oftentimes, 
it, it doesn't happen here at May River, but, but I know the church that I pastor, you know, uh, I always see some guys, you know, that uh, I was there in that year. Never seen once in the church in that year. But I mean, you know, the person be kind of running around, kind of living an ungodly life. But I hear him say, Pastor? Well, he didn't really say Pastor. Pastor. I don't know what they called me here. But what they called me there was preacher. Preacher. So, preacher, I'm a member of your church. I say, What? I haven't seen you, and I've been there 11 years. And you haven't been in one spot. Yeah, preacher, I, I, I'm a member of your church. I remember when preacher such and such is there. I walked down the aisle. I prayed a prayer. The next Sunday, they got me in the baptism waters. And then afterwards, they brought me forward. And what did we do? Stand before here. We're going to have a short business meeting. We want to set brother such and such as a member of the church. All in favor, raise your right hand. Everyone raises their right hand. And I'll come forward, everyone come forward, and get brother such and such the right hand of fellowship. Everyone comes forward, they shake his hand, and then what? He disappears, and there's absolutely nothing that takes place after that for him. If someone is hopefully, like I say, over there is a Sunday school class for you. And that was it. And we've been good at sharing about Christ, getting baptized, but all the times we as Baptists have not been quite so good at verse 20. Teaching, discipling, planning someone to obey all that God has commanded. You know, it's kind of like uh, my, my children. We've been on the mission for 23 years. Supposing you had not seen me in 23 years. We've gone to the mission field. You remember seeing us when I had four kids. 23 years ago, they were a little small, right? So we see each other now after 23 years, and it was always oh, so good to see you, man. It's been a long time. Come on over to the house, and, and, and let's catch up with each other. Yeah, I'd love to come over. We'll come over. And I'd love to see how the kids are doing. After 23 years, you come in, and you see my family. And now my children, 23 years later, are sitting on the floor with diapers sucking their thumbs on the floor. <laughs> what are you going to think about me and my wife? Something went askew. <laughs> Something's not quite right here. Does it happen in some churches? That you see some people who accepted the Lord and you haven't seen them for a while and they're where they were or maybe a little backwards and not doing as well as they should have been doing spiritually speaking, what's the problem? Sometimes the problem may not necessarily be with them. It could have been with the church who did not obey verse 20, who did not take the people and begin to disciple them. You see, because we need to be making disciples who are making disciples, training them to observe all that I've commanded you. Because that's what Jesus told us to do. And I think we as Baptists are beginning to try to really begin to change and do different. So myself as a disciple and you as a disciple, what does Jesus call us to do? To make sure we're obeying all the commands of Christ. So how is your walk with the Lord? You know, more, you know, do people know that you're a Christian by the way you live? So we want to make sure that we're living a godly life, but then we need to be sharing godly truth as disciples of Jesus. And then when we see someone come to faith, we need to get them baptized, and then the onus is on us to begin to train them and teach them how they, too, can begin to follow the Lord Jesus. And that's kind of really what we've been doing in missions. Now, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, because I know you all are thinking about possibly starting and working uh, in either Nepal, India, with some unreached people group. I've mentioned this church in an unreached people group, the Tola people. You know, uh, and so I want you to think for a little bit. If, if you were to go that way, and this is an unreached people group. Now, unreached means, and it may be unengaged. Let me just share some uh, information about India. India has 1.7 billion people, and it might be more than that now. And out of that, there are 2,289 people groups 
of people of different languages like the Tamil, the Telugu, the Gujaratis. Uh, they speak many different languages. But there's over 750 unengaged, unreached peoples. Now that means people of 60, to 60 million or more that have no church, no missionary, no known Christian necessary in that area that's trying to reach them. That's an unengaged people group. An unreached people group that the IMB uses is less than 2% of the people are Christians. All right? So I think that you're probably maybe at least going to an unreached people group. Less than 2%. So, can you guess what the hardest thing, when you're talking about church planting, you know what the hardest thing about church planting is? Oh, it's kind of hard. But kind of one of the hardest things is what? Language. Well, you can get the language. I mean, that's a hard thing. Yes, it's a hard thing. But one of the hardest things is going from zero to one. Because you're going into an area where there's no known Christian. So you can't gather people together for a Bible study because there's none around. All right? So what do you do? How do you begin when you got zero and you got to go to at least that one person? Because then that one person can say, well, I've got a family, I've got a friend, and then you can begin to kind of gather something together. But going from zero to one. Now, it's interesting as we look at uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, looking at verse 13, it says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, a small, small rock. And upon this rock, this bedrock, the fact that I am the Christ, I am the Son of the living God, I, Jesus, will build my church, and the gates of hell shall never keep it from growing and overpowering. Amen. Amen. Because Christ is the Son of God. And then he goes on and says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But we want to look at that phrase for a minute. I will build my church. Because as you go out as missionaries, the thing that we're being mainly about is starting churches. Now it's interesting, as with IMB, Missionaries are kind of people who have all sorts of interesting ideas and were kind of different like I am, you know, and, and they have great thoughts and plans and things. And the missionaries that were in charge would always ask three questions to whatever idea you have. How does whatever your idea get down to evangelism, discipleship, and church planning? If it can't do those three, then we don't need to be done because what we've been called to do is to do evangelism, discipleship, and church planting. Because Jesus said he would do what? He would build his church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So let's just take for instance, if you decide to go to that part of India, the total... Tobar, Tobar people. I think they said they're, I think Pastor Sir said it's a tribal type folk. So supposing you were to go there and you were to start a church. Now, first of all, we've got to think different about church. Because oftentimes we think about a church as what? The building. And all the wonderful, wonderful stuff we have here. But in some places there in India, they're doing more what's called a house church. And so we need to kind of gear our thoughts from a big, huge building like this. One day it will be that way. But as you begin, it's kind of like our brother started to help and head, right? You didn't start with all this, did you? No. You started with how many? Four. Four. And then you get a few and it becomes a little Bible study. And then it began 
to grow to become what it was in those days. And thank you for your service. But you see, that's what it is. So if we kind of think a little bit more of a Bible study. Now, let me just share with you kind of how we were doing it with IMB, and especially in South Asia, because I was part of South Asia, even though I served in Durban, South Asia, sorry, South Africa, I was working on India. So I was part of the diaspora of that organization. So I was with South Asia, so I was taught some things. So I have a little thing. I know you may not be able to see it all that well, but hopefully uh, you can understand it just a little bit. You think of these four quadrants here. And as you begin to start a church, first of all, you've got to engage people. You've got to have some entry into the people. Now, for instance, I'm reaching Indians up in Spartanburg area. So my entry strategy, one of them, is going to quick stop and buying bottles of water. Because most quick stops are owned by Indians. So I buy bottles of water so I can begin to talk with them and then to begin to engage them and to build relationships with them. So you've got to figure out some way that you're going to get into where those people are and what are their needs so you can begin to build relationships. Because remember, in an unreached people group, there's no Christians there that you know of, or very, very few. So we can't put up a sign and say, well, Christians are meeting, here come. Well, there's none around. They don't, they're not interested. So you've got to figure out some way to begin to engage them. But then as you begin to engage them, then you've got to begin to do what? To evangelize. You've got to have some way to share with them about Jesus. Now, my other little chart what I use up here, and I'm sharing with some folks, this may not be the best in India, necessarily, but there's three little circles that you can use. And if you could think a blank, and you draw a circle up here, and you can share with people, you know, God has a perfect design. Right? When he created this world, it was perfect. But actually, you can start it this way. We live in a broken world, don't we? Please raise your hand if you do not believe that we live in a broken world. Everyone believes we live in a broken world. But when God designed this world, it's perfect. If God designed a perfect world, why are we in brokenness today? And then I'll throw a line up here. There's a, it's a three-letter word. Starts with an S. Ends with an N. And the middle letter is a big, big, fat I. Called sin. Disobeying God. I'm doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Right? Now, these little squiggly lines show how people try to escape brokenness. Now, what are some ways that you know people try to escape brokenness? Addiction. Very one. What's some other way? All sorts of different ways. Sometimes materialism. Sometimes getting a very, very new job or whatever. But it's kind of like a bungee cord. Has anyone ever bungee jumped? That'd be the craziest thing in the world to do, I thought. Stand on this bridge with a rope tied around you, ah! and boom! And when you got when you go all the way down, what happens to the cord? It bounces you right back, supposedly where you were. So if I'm in brokenness and I'm getting into a drug addiction, alcohol, whatever, I'm gonna feel good for a while, but it's gonna pull me right back into brokenness. But then you do the other circle down here. God does not and did not want me to stay in brokenness, and He does not want us to stay in brokenness. So what has He done? He sent Jesus, who is God, down to this earth. He did a wonderful miracle. He got a lot of great teaching, but the wonderful, most important thing is what's coming up very soon. Easter. He died on the cross for your sin and my sin. He paid for our sin. They buried him, and on the third day, he rose again from the grave. And Jesus tells me, if I want to go from brokenness back to God's perfect design, I must turn. Turn from my sin. Now, you Bible scholars, what does the word turn mean? There's a Bible word for that. It starts in an R. Repent. Repent. Turn. Have sorrow for my sin. And believe and trust in the Lord Jesus and make him 
Lord of my life. And when I begin to do that, God begins to change me and help me begin to grow to become more like him. But he also wants me to go back to broken people and tell them how they can become unbroken. Now, people are one or two places. You're either in brokenness or in God's perfect design. Where are you today? And where do you want to be? And if you're in brokenness, then you need to get back to God's perfect design. Are you willing to turn from your sin? And are you willing to believe in him? You see, we have to have some kind of a message that's simple and easy that we can share with folks about the Lord Jesus because that's one of the things that missionaries do is begin to evangelize. You've got to figure out something that would fit into the context of the Indian people that you're going to. The three circles does very well here in America. It may not necessarily fit in India. But what then you've got to think through is once you get some people who say yes to Jesus, what did Jesus tell us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20? You've got to get them baptized, first of all, in 19. But then you've got to begin to do what? Teach them, train them to obey all that I commanded. So what's one of the first things you might want to teach someone who says yes to Jesus? You've got some family. You've got some friends. Why don't you go and share with them what God's done for you? Remember the man called Legion in the Bible? Jesus cast out all those demons, and the people come in, and they're afraid of Jesus. They say, leave this area. And he's about to leave because about 2,000 pennies got drowned in the sea. And he's getting in the boat. He's about to leave, and the man who was called Legion, who's now been cleansed in his right mind and clothed now, says, Jesus, let me go with you. And what does Jesus say? No. You don't go with me, but you go home, and you go back to your people, and you tell them what great things God has done for you. So we need to teach people immediately that they can begin to share about what Jesus has done for them. They may not know much. But they can't be like that man. I was blind, but now I see. And then begin to share. And then you need to have something in place that you can begin to help train them to obey. But then as they begin to do it, you're going to begin to send them out to share about Jesus. And as they're going out and they find people who are interested in Jesus, Who's going to begin to train those new people? They are, exactly, because you're training them. And then you, they begin to gather here, and you begin to establish them. And you can begin to establish a group. And you say, I'll teach you what I've been teaching you so you can teach them. And that way you begin to entrust them to begin to start in the group. So it's multiplying groups that multiply out. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, the things that you've heard from me and the presence of many witnesses, these things are to teach others so they're able to teach others also. So that's really what they're doing. So you're going because you're the outsider. You're looking for the insider who's going to reach the people group. You won't, but you find that in, insider who you can begin to train them and then they begin to reach. And when you've got 60 million or 70 million, 80 million people, you don't have time to send a lot of people to seminary and wait for a pastor. So you're training people there to be, do very simple, easy Bible study. And like what we do is that they would read the Word of God. You could ask some simple questions. What does this passage say? The who, what, when, where, and how? <coughs> All right. Number one question. You go over that very good. So they don't really have preaching. They have more of a Bible discussion. I guess that's why I ask questions. But then the next question is, now, as we discuss this and you've looked at it, what do you feel like God wants you to obey? And they could share, well, God spoke to me about this or that, all right? And who could you share or tell this truth to? So you teach them how to share the gospel, and then they have a Bible story they can tell. And they go out. So the next week when they come in, what's the first thing that they do? Besides sing a little bit, they pray a little bit. Then they say, how did you obey what you said you were going to do last week? And they ask each other. Mark chapter 6 is the verse that tells us why we can do it. Mark chapter 6, the early part, Jesus sends some disciples out to minister. Verse 30, those same disciples that Jesus sent out come back to him, and they share with him all that they had done and said. 
some accountability. I wonder why we don't hang out at church sometimes. You know, maybe we need to be answered as to how have you been following the Lord? Not legalistically, lovingly. And that's kind of what they do. And then when they find people that, who are sharing and say, oh, that's wonderful. You found someone else that accepted the Lord. Now I'll teach you so that they're teaching others. And that's how the groups grow. Let me tell you one quick story and we'll close. In 2001, Yi Kai went to a province in China, Ying and Grace. They were our house that I know of. He's Taiwanese. He was sent by and be to a province of 20 million people. And in that 20 million people, he did find three little churches. But when he added up the number of this church, this church, and this church, he added up to 250. Chinese believers to reach 20 million people. He was a man of prayer, so he spent a lot of time in prayer. And he went to one of the pastors and said, Pastor, I think we need to start at least 200 new churches. The pastor laughed at him and said, go home, it'll never happen. These people here are factory workers and farmers, less than a fourth grade education, go home. It'll never happen. He said, well, let me try. He says, okay. So he invited all 250 Christian Chinese to come to a little meeting to learn how to start churches. So they came, and he only had 30 people come to that first meeting. And he had four things on his agenda. He said, first of all, I'm going to teach you what to share. So I'm going to teach you how to share your testimony. Right before you became a Christ, how you became a Christian, and life afterwards. Get all the churchy words out. You can't use the word saved. Because if these people have never been to church and they say, I was saved at the age of eight, what are they thinking? You were in the swimming pool and I was in last night. You know, and it was too much chlorine water, and you got in your lungs, and someone jumped in, gave you CPR, and the water was blah, blah, and you say, you say. <laughs> Get all those words out. Make it simple and plain that people are going to understand. So they practiced it 30, 40, 50, 60 times. They were good at sharing that story. About a minute or so. He says, now, second of all, who are you going to share it with? 20 million people. He said, I want you to take a piece of paper and write down the names of 10 people you know that need to hear your story. So they wrote those down. He says, now we're going to pray and ask God, the Holy Spirit, to put upon your heart five of those ten people. So they prayed. He says, now circle them. He says, that's your target. Your story to these five people this week. Third thing is, he knew that they would ask because Chinese people are very polite. They probably wouldn't ask, but why in the world should I do what you have told me to do? He said, next week we're going to sit in a group and each of us is going to have the wonderful joy and privilege of sharing how it went with you five times sharing your story. A little bit of accountability. Then what happens if they say yes? He says, I'll teach you how you can begin to train them and teach them and how you can disciple them. All right? So it's sent them out. This is the first week. The next week, second week, 18 showed up. And out of that 18, only 15 had shared five times their life story. This was the second week. So he said, let's practice start sharing our life story again. So they practiced it again, practiced it again. He says, now I'm sending you out to share with another five people. And if you don't share with five people this week, don't come back. This is the second week. The church population grew from 2001 to 2003 from 250 to 104,000. And now it's up to 6 to 8 to 10 million people. It wasn't other missionaries coming in. It wasn't evangelists. It wasn't other pastors coming in. It was simply yin and grace and those Chinese believers teaching them so they could teach others. And we call it training for training. They will be sharing this story. So you see, as you think about going and starting some churches, just think of a little Bible study and training people so they can share, so they can share. So the question comes as we go. Where are you today? Are you in brokenness or are you in God's perfect design? If you're in brokenness, then will you willing to turn to your sin and will you place your faith and trust in Christ? If you are one, then the question comes, when's the last time you told the story? Is there people that you know that you need to tell the story with this week? And will you go this week and share the story with them? Thank you so, so very much for allowing me to share with you. I'll turn it over to the pastor.